Welcome to Hub History, the show where we share our favorite stories from Boston history. This is episode 93, Folk Magic and Mysteries at the Fairbanks House. Hi, I'm Jake. And I'm Nikki. This week, we're going to discuss one of the oldest houses in North America, and the evidence that has been uncovered that generations of residents may have believed in an ancient form of counter magic. Their folk magic practices derived from Puritan religious traditions, but included elements of Catholic symbolism and ancient pagan beliefs. The inhabitants of Dedham's Fairbanks house used charms and hex marks in an attempt to ward off evil forces that might have included witches, demons, and even disease. Fairbanks House Museum curator Daniel Neff will be joining us in just a few minutes to explain the evidence he's found and what it can tell us about the Fairbanks family and the world they lived in. But before Daniel tells us about the magic and mysteries of the Fairbanks House, it's time to take a look at this week's featured historic site and upcoming event. Because we're going to be discussing one of the oldest houses in North America this week, we wanted to feature a 17th century house as our historic site as well. There are only a handful of houses remaining in the city of Boston that were built prior to 1700. The James Blake House, the Paul Revere House, the Thomas Mayo House, and the Pierce House, which is near the corner of Adams and Ashmont Streets in Dorchester. The house was built in 1683 by James Minot, and in 1696, he sold the property to the successful farmer Thomas Pierce. Over the next 272 years, Ten generations of the Pierce family lived in and added on to the home, until Roger Pierce died in 1968, and his heirs sold the house and related collections to Historic New England for preservation. Here's how Historic New England describes the property. Pierce House is one of the last surviving examples of 17th century architecture in the city of Boston. Lived in by ten generations of one family, the house documents the building practices and the tastes of the Pierces over three centuries. Family members expanded and adapted their house to meet demands for space, function, comfort, and privacy. The Pierce family story highlights key aspects of social, local, and New England history. Find out how a middle-class New England family worked hard to provide for themselves and their children over 350 years. The Pierce family took part in both local and national events. During the American Revolution, Colonel Samuel Pierce participated in the fortification of Dorchester Heights. Architectural viewports and special lighting highlight many of the rare surviving 17th century features, such as beautifully chamfered framing members and a nearly complete exterior wall of original riven clapboards. The Pierce House is located at 24 Oakton Avenue in Dorchester, which is walking distance from Ashmont Station on the Red Line, and it has on-street parking right out front. Visiting the Pierce House, however, can be a bit of a challenge, as it's only open for tours three days a year. The next time it'll be open is October 27th, when it will be open from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. with a $5 admission fee. We'll include more information in this week's show notes, along with some photos from the tour we took in January. And for our upcoming event this week, we have an annual event from Old South Meeting House. Every summer, they celebrate Phyllis Wheatley Day, commemorating the famous enslaved poet who was once a member of the Old South Church congregation. This year, Phyllis Wheatley Day will be celebrated at Old South Meeting House on August 18th, from noon to 2 p.m. Here's the description from their website. Travel back in time to the 1770s with African-American poet Phyllis Wheatley to explore the meeting house as it was when she attended church here. Phyllis Wheatley, portrayed by a Freedom Trail Foundation player dressed in full 18th century costume, will share her experiences as a writer, churchgoer, and enslaved woman in colonial Boston. Phyllis will speak at 12 p.m. and at 1 p.m. The Phyllis Wheatley program is free with museum admission. And now it's time for this week's main topic. For this week's main topic, we're going to be joined by Daniel Neff, curator of the Fairbanks House Museum in Dedham, Massachusetts. We invited Daniel to come and talk with us today after seeing him speak at History Camp Boston last month, where he was presenting on the topic of ghosts and graffiti, superstition and belief in the Fairbanks House. In his talk, he presented an argument that there is evidence that somebody who lived in the house, 
perhaps multiple generations of somebodies, believed in powerful folk magic. Before we speak with Daniel, here are a couple of quick reminders about the Fairbanks House Museum. The Fairbanks House has the distinction of being the oldest wooden framed building in North America, and it's most likely the oldest surviving building in Massachusetts. It's located on East Street near Dedham Square. Today, that's just a few blocks outside of Boston city limits, near the southeastern corner of Hyde Park. But back in the 17th and 18th centuries, Dedham was separated from Boston by quite a distance. At first by wilderness, then later by the independent towns of Dorchester and Roxbury, both of which are now part of Boston. As we speak with Daniel, we'll reference the tragic story of Jason Fairbanks a few times without ever getting into the details. Listeners who are interested in hearing the story of Jason Fairbanks' love affair with Eliza Fales, his conviction for her murder and attempted suicide, his escape from prison, recapture, and eventual execution by hanging, should listen to Hub History Episode 10, where we tell the story in more detail. It's also important to keep in mind, as we talk about early New Englanders' belief in witchcraft and magic, that this isn't a sign that they were irreligious. Some people who learn about the Salem witchcraft trials, or accusations of witchcraft in 17th century Boston, assume that belief in magic ran counter to Puritan beliefs. In fact, the opposite is true. People believed in forms of magic because of their strong Puritan beliefs. Puritans treated the devil as a literal presence in the world that was actively trying to harm them physically and spiritually by afflicting them bodily or diverting them from righteousness. In his book, The Devil's Dominion, Magic and Religion in Early New England, Richard Godbeer argues that the use of counter-magic, like what Daniel will tell us about, actually arises from a conflict within Puritan theology. Church teachings were ambivalent about the source of evil and temptation was evil found within each person's heart, making the struggle to live morally internal? Or was it found in Satan and demons who walked the earth in physical form and had to be battled externally? If it was the latter, then the otherwise good, pious Puritans who tried charms or hex marks as a form of counter-magic were only using all the weapons in their arsenal to hold off the evil forces that walked amongst them in this world. So with all that in mind, It's time for us to speak with this week's guest. All right, we just want to welcome Daniel Neff, the curator of the Fairbanks House Museum in Dedham, to the show. Hello. Daniel, Nikki and I are lucky enough to live very close to the Fairbanks House Museum, so we've actually visited there a few times. For our listeners who aren't familiar or maybe have never been there, can you start out by explaining what the Fairbanks House is and why it's important? The Fairbanks House? is the oldest wooden structure standing in North America. Uh, It was built in 1637, added to significantly over the years. Uh, The last portion added around 1800. It was lived in by eight generations of one family, the Fairbanks. So 1637, Jonathan and Grace Fairbanks moved to uh, Dedham with their, or moved into the house with their six children. And then the last generation, a lady named Rebecca Fairbanks moved out in 1904. And at that time, it became a museum, and it has been a museum still owned and operated by the Fairbanks family today. So, Daniel, you mentioned that the house was built in 1637, but for those of us who have been there, or if you see a picture online, the brickwork in the chimney says 1636. So can you tell us how that uh, discrepancy came to be and how you know like, how old the house actually is? Absolutely. So for many years, they did believe it was built in 1636, uh, because if you look at the town records, that's the year the family was admitted into the town of Dedham. Side note, the the town was founded in 1635 by roughly 35, 36 families. Uh, The Fairbanks are the first family admitted into the town after it's founded. So they're not technically founding members, but they're as close as you can get. Uh, So they were admitted into town in 36. So for a while, without looking any further into it, the assumption was they must have built the house in 36. Uh, But doing a little more research, um, that didn't quite quite line up right. So uh, we wanted to make sure we were, you know, could still hold the claim of oldest uh, wooden structure. So uh, ways back, uh, well before I got here, they did what's called dendrochronology, 
tree ring dating. So what they did is they took a core sample out of several of the most important beams, and particularly the uh, the summer beam in the hall, uh, which the summer beam is the beam that holds up the rest of the house. So it is by necessity the first thing that goes up when you're building. So it means like it if however old the summer beam is, that's how old the house is. Uh, so yeah, they took out a core sample, they looked at the rings, not just the number of rings, but the width of the rings compared it to other trees, weather data, uh, did some other very complicated stuff, uh, that it was uh, done by Oxford, so I assume they knew what they were doing. And, uh, they figured out that that tree that the summer beam was made from was felled in 1637. Back then, they did not age your season wood before they used it. Uh, so if the tree is felled in 1637, that is the year they would have used it to build the house. And so, uh, we've been, you know, since we did the gender chronology, we've been pretty confident that it was 1637. And actually, if you keep going in those town records, it lines up because, uh, 1636, they're admitted into town in 36, but it's in like early to mid fall and they wouldn't have had time to build a whole house before the first freeze. Hmm. And so, and actually back then, um, it's a lot easier to move a large tree with a sled than it is with a cart. So they would have actually wanted to wait. They would have, over the winter, felled all the trees they needed, moved them to the site with sleds, and then as soon as the ground thawed in the spring of 37, they'd start building. And they worked fast enough back then they would be done by the uh, by the fall of 37, and the Fairbanks could move in. So actually the town records and the Denver chronology line up, which is really nice. That doesn't always happen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I guess before we move on into later generations – what were the Fairbanks doing in Dedham in 1637? So how did they fit into the fabric of the community back then? What were their occupations? Uh, that's really interesting because I've been, I've been doing quite a bit of research on like why they came over in the first place, what they did once they got here. So if you look at Jonathan Fairbanks, the sort of founder of the family, um, he back in Yorkshire – he was a wood turner. Uh, he built things using a lathe, and he specialized in building spinning wheels. Which, if you look at Yorkshire, um, there's really only one industry in Yorkshire in the 1600s, sheep. You have people raise sheep, they harvest wool, they make you know, clothing and other items out of the wool. So being somebody who makes spinning wheels is useful, but you're not the only guy doing it. Um, so... A variety of things sort of combined to make it really unappealing for the Fairbanks to stay in England. Uh, first off, Jonathan inherits no land, and there's no land to buy. England's overcrowded. There's a new tax on wood, which is what he uses for his livelihood. And there's some new persecutions of people who don't agree with the Anglican Church, which he definitely does not agree with the Anglican Church. So he's got a few different reasons that he doesn't want he himself, his wife, and his six kids growing up, you know, living, continuing to live or grow up in England. So they come over here. Uh, while they they make it to Boston first, we think somewhere around 1633, and he me meets a guy named John Dwight. And uh, John Dwight is a wool comber. So a wool comber and a guy who makes spinning wheels are going to interact in some fashion, right? Um, so John Dwight is one of the founding members of Dedham. Um, and so shortly after they, uh, I think what happened is shortly after they formed, they realized that nobody in the community was a wood turner. Nobody knew how to build spinning wheels and they're all making their, they all want to make their own clothes because importing stuff from England would be really expensive. So they're like, well, we need a guy. And John Dwight says, well, I, I happen to know a guy who's at least Puritan leaning. He's not full blown Puritan, but he's Puritan leaning and he builds spinning wheels. So I think that's how Jonathan ends up being the first new uh addition into the the Dedham community uh he has that skill set they needed um and so he from what i understand he he was fairly wealthy actually by uh by doing that uh based on tax records the fairbanks house was the third largest house in Dedham in the 1600s uh after the magistrate and the priest <laughs> So we have done an episode uh, actually very early on on Jason Fairbanks and the yep. murder mystery surrounding him. Mm -hmm. So could you refresh our listeners on how the, the Fairbanks trial impacted the family's finances and how that perhaps preserved the house to the state we have today? Yeah, um, that's uh, that you, you said, though, I always like to say there are three things that have kept the house where it is today. Um, 
It was very well built. It was well taken care of and blind luck. <laughs> um, and actually part of that blind luck is the timing of what happened with Jason. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have uh, the guy in charge of the house at that time is Jason's older brother, Ebenezer Fairbanks Jr. And Jr. is not very good at running a farm. Uh, by this point, they've stopped the woodworking that his ancestors did, and they're really just running a farm. But Ebenezer Jr. doesn't do it very well, and he's having a lot of financial issues. And then Jason is um, put on trial and found guilty, and both Jason and the rest of the Fairbanks family continue to insist Jason was innocent. Um, even after he was executed, Ebenezer continued to insist that his young brother was was innocent. He was framed, and he actually started self-publishing books about how innocent Jason was, and what little was left of the family fortune, he dried up putting out all these books and pamphlets and everything about how his already executed brother was innocent. And this was all. So, um, Ebenezer Jr. And Jason together, uh, sort of simultaneously ruined the family's fortune and the family's reputation. And, uh, so the silver lining though, is that, uh, the house gets inherited by three of Ebenezer Jr.'s daughters, Prudence, Sally, and Nancy. Um, and they also inherit his debt. Uh, so they end up um, selling off most of the, the family's land holdings to pay off his debts. And then they don't really have much money. They make their lives as uh, their livelihood as uh, spinsters. Um, and uh, so they make enough money to get by, but not enough money to, um, shall we say, indulge in the practices of the what people often call the Victorian era. Um, you know, Victorians are into bigger, better, newer, fancier. Who cares if it's older, historic, tear it down, build a nicer one. Uh, while everybody else is doing that, the Fairbanks, the three sisters living in the house, um, can just barely maintain what they have. Um, so if Ebenezer Jr. and Jason hadn't ruined everything, um, later generations would have been able to afford ruining everything on purpose. So uh, <laughs> so the, the Jason Fairbanks trial was in the very early years of the 19th century, 1801 yeah. or Yeah, two, 1801, yeah. So when did the sisters take over management of the house? So uh, Ebenezer Jr., uh, lives until 1832. And so when he dies, he officially leaves the house to his wife and three daughters, three of his five daughters. Um, two of his daughters did manage to get married and move away. Um, but the three that never got, yeah, (laughs) uh, the three that never got married, um, inherited the house with their mother. And then, uh, their mother, Mary Fairbanks passed away a few years after Ebenezer jr. And then they got full custody of the house. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was already getting into the mid 1800s by the time they're fully in charge. And by that point, the, the, uh, the idea of, um, home improvement was really starting to take off, shall we say. And, uh, but yeah, like I said, they just maintained what they had. At most, they added some wallpaper to a couple of rooms. That was about it. So getting into the Victorian era, they're still living in what's essentially, at least at its core, still a very, 17th century house yes very much in even uh rebecca who um was the niece of the three sisters she's the last one to live there she moves out in 1904 when she moves out there is still uh no electricity no running water and no heat except what's provided by the fireplaces so even to 1904 it is effectively a first period house so Daniel, we invited you to come and talk with us today after we saw you speak at History Camp last month. You are presenting on the topic of ghosts and graffiti, superstition and belief at the Fairbanks House. So since you took over as curator, you've discovered evidence or maybe reinterpreted evidence that shows that somebody who lived in the house and maybe over several generations believed in a form of powerful folk magic. Can you tell us sort of how you started down that, that route? When I started as curator, the prior curator showed me uh, that there was what's called a hex mark over the fireplace and uh, talked about how the, the, the idea was the hex mark protected uh, the house and the evil spirits couldn't go past a properly drawn hex mark or carved hex mark. Um, and so you put it over the chimney because the chimney being always open is a very easy entry point for evil spirits, witches, that sort of thing. And uh, she also mentioned the, uh, that there, they had found shoes in the wall. Uh, which she had done some research on and found that they were thought to protect the house from witches. But that was about the extent of it. There was this hex mark over the fireplace, and there was these shoes to protect from witches. Okay. 
So, um, I already had some background in this stuff before I worked at the Fairbanks house. I had spent three years giving ghost tours up in Boston. Um, as a, as a teenager, I was fascinated with occult history and weird stuff and well, still am. Like all teenagers uh, are. Yeah, right. All, all te- <laughs> yeah, but I never really lost it and I, I ended up making it kind of part of my profession. So, um, <laughs> And so uh, I already had sort of a, a rough idea of how this stuff would would look. Um, and then I, you know, because I already knew there was some in the house from that one over the fireplace that was uh, already identified, I, I started looking around um, <clears throat> to see if there's anything else. And sure enough, um, it seems like every time I go looking, I find more stuff that yeah, there's no other explanation for other than this is um, hex marks or if you want to get academic apotropaic markings. Ooh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what what makes a hex mark? If somebody's looking at the wall of an old house, how will they know that's what they're seeing? Yeah, so um, that can be the tricky part. Um, there's a variety of different kinds and um, really you need to understand the context because uh, – they're not the only thing that would be carved into walls. You have uh, children and teenagers with knives and spare time that could just write random things on the walls. You have uh, what are called carpenter's marks, which are used in the construction of the house. And you have all sorts of other things. Um, so you have to sort of filter through all this other stuff that the marks could be. And then you compare them to other marks. And the best uh, sort of place to start is English churches. Because you know the marks there aren't going to be, or unlikely, to be things other than something uh, religious. Um, and so the common ones are um, uh, what's called like a, a pinwheel or hex foil design, um, which you see a lot in German, Dutch, uh, Pennsylvania decorations. And the general thought is there, it's meant more decorative, but if you see them carved into a wall in a New England building, that's more protective than decorative. Those are the ones that look like a, a circle with the arcs within it that, that make up sort of a daisy shape? Uh, usually a series of um, circles or ovals that interlock and look vaguely like a, a daisy or um, kind of like spokes on a wheel. Uh, that's very common in uh, German, Dutch um, based cultures like in Pennsylvania, they're used mostly decoratively. But if you see them carved into a wall up in New England, that's more likely to be a protective mark. Uh, you also see circles, uh, X's. Um, what's one that's very common in the Fairbanks house is a series of three X's. Um, my understanding is that it's always three because uh, when Jesus was crucified, there's three crosses. It's him and two other guys, so three crosses, three X's. And the so X, the X, the X stands for a cross in that context. Yes, and uh, having done some research more recently, it's a specific cross. It's Saint Andrew's cross. Uh, Saint Andrew was one of the a lot of saints um, who were about to be crucified insisted they be crucified in some weird way because they didn't want to die the same way as Jesus. So, like Peter was crucified upside down. Um, Saint Andrew was crucified on an X shaped uh, cross instead of a cross shaped cross. Um, and so the, the X is St. Andrew's cross, and that's particularly interesting in the context of the Fairbanks house, because one of St. Andrew's things was um, a protection from disease and from that sort of thing. So, uh, And we think that might be why there's so many hex marks. So yeah, it's it, a lot of it's context. If they're on door frames, window frames, uh, near the chimney, those are much more likely to be hex marks than standard graffiti items or carpenter's marks. Um, So you kind of combine location and context and shapes. And if you know what you're looking at, it's, it can be pretty clear. Um, Another interesting hex mark shape is um, it looks like a W or an M, but it's actually meant to be a pair of V's either upside right or upside down. Um, And those stand for uh, Virgo Virgin. I always pronounce this wrong. Virgo Virginium which is Latin, and I'm probably butchering it, I don't know Latin. But anyway, it effectively means virgin of virgins. It's asking for the Virgin Mary's assistance, Um, which I thought was particularly interesting. There's several cases of the double V in the Fairbanks house, and they're Puritan uh, and later Protestant. 
Um, and I feel like asking for Virgin Mary's help is a decidedly Catholic thing to do. Yeah, actually, the St. Andrew's Cross really sounds surprisingly Catholic for the Puritan descended Fairbanks. Yeah, exactly. And so um, the the combination of those two um, has led me to think there must be, and the sheer quantity of hex marks in the house uh, has led me to believe that it, it seems like there's a level of desperation involved, um, sort of... Uh, Whatever they're trying to do, they're really, really desperate to do it um, with these marks. So I guess before we get into some of the specific markings you found, what are these meant to guard against? Or what are these these marks for? Who are they trying to keep out if you put a, a hex mark over the mantle? The hex marks are, are predominantly to protect the house and the people in it from evil spirits, uh, demonic forces, the devil himself. Um, actually, another uh, hex mark that's seen in several places in the house is what's called a demon trap. And it's a series of uh, hatch marks, you know, um, inner, inner uh, crossing lines, uh, usually very complicated. And uh, they believe that demons... Um, if they saw something like this, they were compelled to trace the complex pattern with their finger. And the idea was you would make the pattern so complex that the demon would spend the whole night tracing. And by the time he was done, the sun was up and he would have to go back from whence he came and couldn't bother your family. So, yeah, that was the idea that there was uh, Puritanism and the early versions of Protestantism that came from it. Uh, sort of believe that like the devil and his agents were both real and actively trying to sway you towards evil and trying to hurt you. And so even though the church itself thought these, all magic was Satan's magic. There was no other kind of magic according to the Puritan church officially. But then you have all these Puritan people who uh, their ancestors used folk magic. And so they're using folk magic kind of on the down low they're pretending they're not doing it but they're all doing it <laughs> and so it's it's a, this sort of weird combination of old uh old really old versions of catholicism and really old versions of pagan ideas kind of seeping down through the generations to puritans who are pretending they're not doing it but absolutely doing it and uh they because again they feel all these things are real and they're going to use folk or white magic um, or apotropaic magic to protect themselves from all these evils. Uh, but of course, the most common evil was witches. They're, they're everywhere. So speaking of witches, I was fascinated by your explanation of the shoe at history camp yeah. and how a shoe can protect your family from witches. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, the, the, so what you would do is you take a shoe uh, that was very well worn, and that's important. Not a new shoe. Yeah, it can't be new shoes. Those won't help. It has to be an old, beat up, beat up shoe. Like you ran a marathon in this shoe, probably. <laughs> or or you've worn the shoe for several years, and there's no way to repair it anymore. Like really, really worn out. Um, and that's important because so the the very thing a witch is trying to take from you is your essence or a little bit of your soul, and so. What does that have to do with shoes? Well, uh, at the end of a long day, you've run a marathon or whatever. You take off your shoes and you get that smell. Um, that funk. Yeah, that funk, right? That today we understand is your foot sweat sticking up your shoes. Happens to everybody. Well, they thought that was literally your essence getting trapped in your footwear back in the day. And so, okay, we've got these old shoes full of essence. Well, hey, that's what the witch is trying to steal from us. So we take those shoes and we put them in the walls, preferably near the fireplace, near the chimney, because that's a witch's favorite way to get into the house. And why there's so many hex marks near the, the fireplace is if you have all your doors properly, your doors and windows properly closed, the witch's easiest way to get in the house is to turn herself into a smoke or vapor and float down the chimney, come out into your, your house, turn back into a witch, and now she can take your essence at her leisure. So you have these shoes full of essence near the chimney. She's floating down. She senses the essence in the shoes and goes to check it out. And the witch goes into the shoe to try and steal the essence. And part of the legend of witches uh, back then was that a witch can't move backwards. So the witch goes into the shoe to steal the essence, can't back out of the shoe. 
you've trapped a witch in your old footwear. Just like you could trap a shark in yeah, your footwear. Right, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, witches were apparently very similar to sharks. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, that's what always fascinates me about witches is how complex the the folklore around them was and how many layers of just, like, weird logic leaps were involved in deciding you could catch a witch with your old shoes. Has the, the nice side benefit that a thrifty Puritan didn't have to give up a new expensive pair of shoes, only the ones that were beyond salvage. Yeah, right? That's, that, it's very Puritan protection. Because, <laughs> you know, we never want to throw anything away, but we also don't <laughs> want to use new things for something like throwing in the wall. So, oh, hey, yeah, this works better with old shoes. What a coincidence. So speaking of things in the walls, um, yeah. you described it at History Camp, finding near the shoes something you described as a spiritual midden. Uh, what What's that? We haven't 100% found one at the Fairbanks house, but we found things that might have been. Um, so often the shoes could be sort of referred to as part of a spiritual midden. But the general idea was that it would be a pile of items important to the family or to a specific family member that you're trying to protect. Um, and it was a form of what's called sympathetic magic. Think of it as like reverse voodoo. So, like, the idea of voodoo is you have something related to the person, you can hurt the person. This is you have something related to the person, it protects the person. Or the magic, the bad things happen to the stuff instead of the person. Really sort of creepy side note of this is what's called a puppet. Yeah, it's like a puppet, uh, but it's supposed to represent a specific person. Uh, it's almost, it, like I said, it's a reverse voodoo doll, pretty much. The idea was the puppet, it was usually made with the person's hair or fingernails or even blood or other things mixed into the stuffing of it and the any evil magic intended for the person would go to the poppet instead um or you would have uh what's called witch bottles which again same thing various bodily things go into the bottle uh usually urine um and other things and then i think i just read a quote from i want to say it was increase mather it could have been cotton railing against the the urine experiment is is that what he would have been referring that's, to there yeah that's almost certainly what he's talking about yeah uh, or something very similar um so yeah people would take these bottles or, or jars or whatever and stuff those into the walls uh as another layer of protection from evil spirits and witches now while we were prepping for this episode nikki and i had a healthy debate about whether a cat has been found anywhere at the Fairbanks house, or we just imagined because it seems so appropriate that we imagined one had been. Is there a cat in your wall or under your doorstep that you know of? <laughs> under not, your hearth, maybe. <laughs> not that I found. Not that we found. Now um, there are other houses. I think where you got there are other houses where they have found cats in the walls, but not at the Fairbanks house. Yeah, I know the Three Cranes Tavern in Charlestown, which is also first period, very similar mm -hmm. time period. Um, when that was excavated, I want to say in the 90s or early 2000s, they did find a cat under the doorstep there. So maybe I'm, yeah, maybe I'm mixing the two up. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Like it's, it's in the same genre of protections. Was well, you could put shoes, you could put witch bottles, you could put cats. Yeah, all these things served roughly the same purpose. I hear the cat was dual purpose, both protected against witches and mice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there was always that idea that, like, a thing that if it did something when it was live or active, it would keep doing it if you preserved it. So, yeah, a, a cat that would hunt mice while it was alive would protect your house from mice when it was dead. It made sense to them. So, when, when people think about witchcraft and charms and counter magic and, and hex marks, our minds probably go to the, the late 17th century, sort of the era of the Salem witch trials. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of the when the markings you found in the Fairbanks house date from? Are they around that same period, earlier, later? Uh, it's interesting. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest they're from multiple generations. Um, and it's possible that um, some of them were from that era, the Salem witch trials. Um, so even though there were never any witch trials in Dedham itself, the people in Dedham would have absolutely heard about what was happening in Salem and probably would have reacted in, in somewhat of a dramatic fashion, I'm sure. So some of the marks, I think actually it, it seems possible that a lot of the marks that are in the hall nearest the, the main fireplace, the hearth, those appear to be older or um, they're at least they're 
carved deeper into the wood and and they just seem like they might have been there longer they seem like they've had time to be carved and then worn down a little uh, so those ones are probably the oldest i think the majority of the marks actually come from the late 18th early 19th century though based on the the majority of them are found in the two wings of the house um so just basically the house really has three sections. There's the original house in the middle. A uh, west wing was uh added around 1700 and then uh, but heavily modified around 1800 and then the east wing was added in 1800. Um so most of the marks show up in the two wings, which means so they if can't. those weren't even constructed until around 1800, then they must be newer than that. That's really interesting. Yeah, exactly. So that's why um, the timing actually works out that it's right around the same time as Ebenezer Fairbanks Jr. and Jason, um, right around that same time as them. So, Daniel, I have a question about, I guess, the uh, newer wing, which is you just said is around 1800. So I will preface this by saying that I would not necessarily identify as a believer of the supernatural. I would say I am optimistically curious but uh mm-hmm. turn to science first so the Same first here. time i visited the house i think was before uh you took over the curatorship of the house and um you know we looked at the hex marks on the mantle but we didn't really talk about anything else in the house beyond that and um we were in that wing for a tour and i was so uncomfortable in that wing like I don't know. I've never really had an experience like that in another place where I really was just uncomfortable and a little scared and I really wanted to leave. (laughs) And then I saw your talk at history camp and it all kind of made sense. Right. So tell, tell us more. Uh, So first I've sort of to respond to your first comment. Uh, I consider myself an optimistic skeptic. What I mean by that is, uh, I, I believe the potential for stuff. This stuff is very real. There's a lot about this universe we don't understand, but my bar for evidence is very high. You got to do a lot to convince me something's paranormal. That being said, I've been here for about two and a half years, and I have seen a lot of, heard, experienced a lot of stuff I cannot explain. Um, now, one thing about the the West Wing is, I'm sure the part of the house you were <laughs> referring to. Because actually, whenever we have people who consider themselves sensitive or, or a medium or anything like that, they almost always get a feeling of, of dread or just sort of uneasiness in the yeah, West Yeah, I'm wing. not as sensitive. And I'm like the opposite of that, though. <laughs> <laughs> I probably am, too. But um, but maybe you just picked up on something that night or whatever or that day. Um, because, yeah, um, we've had multiple people who are in the West Wing who, who have said, like, I, I need to leave. I, I can't in this room some of them were mediums or sensitives others were just people who had no prior interest in the paranormal or, or anything but just like had a weird feeling in that room in that wing um so you're definitely not alone in that so yeah that west wing really gives off a, a weird vibe interestingly over in the east wing um the other newer part of the house uh there is one spot in the room where um on three separate occasions during a ghost tour um, a woman has fainted in that room and they've always been standing in the exact same spot. It's always very brief. Like they sort of, they get really faint and they, they find a nearby chair. Uh, and I have a chair like right there just in case, cause it's happened three times now. Um, and, but like, and they're fine just, you know, seconds later, but, uh, it's just weird that it's always a woman and she's always standing in the same place. Um, and like I said, three times, uh, it stops being, you know, twice you can call it a coincidence. Three times it starts getting a little weird. So yeah, the the the, the activity uh, or the the weirdness, the stuff that's hard to explain, definitely seems to be mostly in the the wings, the east wing and the west wing. So if those wings date from around the time of the the family's reversal in fortunes, we we mm-hmm. might say they're looking more to these sort of supernatural forms of assistance. Does that reveal a sort of like a sense of desperation with the family? Do you think? I think so. Uh, Yeah. Um, I think Jason is not the only member of the family that's having issues at that point. So we have um, Ebenezer Jr.'s aunt, um, so Ebenezer Sr.'s sister, uh, named Abigail Fairbanks, lives in the house um, her entire life, uh, dies when she's in her mid-80s, I think. 
and the doctor refers to her as dying of a palsy. And palsy was what they referred to pretty much any movement disorder, anything like Parkinson's, uh, tick disorders, Tourette's, anything like that, anything that involves involuntary movement um, that tends to be repetitive, they would just call all of that palsy. So she has something um, that she died of, and it, but before that, it kept her from being self-sufficient. It kept her from ever getting, it kept her from ever getting married or moving out. Um, so there, there's something, uh, a health issue that this woman has that affects her whole life. Then you have um, Ebenezer Jr.'s oldest son, Calvin Fairbanks, uh, effectively drinks himself to death when he's 22. Um, and that's only a year or two before Jason is put on trial. Um, and then you have Jason's younger brother, or no, sorry, Jason's slightly older brother, sorry. Abner Fairbanks was born two years before Jason and died almost exactly one month after Jason was hanged. And that is literally everything we know about Abner Fairbanks, which is weird. We have at least some information about everybody else in that generation. But I can tell you Abner's name and when he was born, when he died, and nothing else about him, which suggests um, there's something, something the family didn't want to talk about in relation to him. In your talk at History Camp, you made reference to signs in the house that the family might have been seeking supernatural assistance for what we consider a, a medical problem here in the, the material world. Do you yes. think that's related to Abner? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Abner and or Abigail, um, I think, are the, the reasons for the Maybe Jason to some extent, um, because he had definitely had some medical issues too. But I think it's it's uh, Abigail and Abner are both more likely uh, the reasons why they would go to these lengths. So what what is or what was found in the west wing of the house that you believe connects to a sort of a, a medical issue? First off, the, uh, the a room in the west wing has by far the most hex marks. Um, it has uh, a, a full half of all the hex marks in the house are in one small room. And uh, somewhat unsettlingly, that room has a lock on the outside of the door. Now, part of why I think there's this sort of, like, medical and magic connection is because um, at the time, people did not understand these movement disorders. Like, they knew there was a medical source of things like what they called palsies. But then there's stuff like uh, epilepsy and anything that causes seizures, which is just completely beyond them in 1800. And um, all the way back to the ancient Greeks, epilepsy was viewed as a punishment by the gods in ancient Greece. And so there's this long standing all the way back to the ancient Greeks. There's this feeling that epilepsy or seizures or anything like that is something supernatural, something otherworldly. And so it's pretty easy to make that make that leap between the magic and the, the medical issue. And so other things that uh, support this possibility um, so again, the majority of those hex marks in that room are the St. Andrew's cross and St. Andrew. Um, one of the things he's the saint of is protection against disease, specifically, uh, seizures and, uh, that sort of thing, uh, and, and epilepsy. And then on further inspection, I realized that right out in front of that door with the lock on it, uh, on the floor, there is a nail, a brass nail driven into the center of one of the boards. And all the other nails in the house are iron. There are no other brass nails I've found anywhere else. So, okay, why is one brass nail in the middle of the floor? So I did a lot of research and found very little for very long. And then eventually I found this one academic paper. And the, um, the person who wrote it was, was saying that they had found several texts that suggest that if someone has a seizure or an epileptic fit... What you do is you watch where, uh, when they have their fit, they're going to collapse. So you watch where their head lands, and then you drive a nail into the ground where their head landed, and that will effectively pin the epilepsy to the ground, and it will cure them. And I think that's what that nail is doing there, is that it was an attempt to use this old folk magic trick to try and take somebody's issues away somebody's epilepsy or something similar uh, away and um i'm i'm assuming it probably didn't work well it probably worked about as well as medicine at the time yeah right it, with, which is pretty much not at all I, I, and that's i think uh, sort of the crux no matter why this stuff was so prevalent 
is that it was it's just as effective as any medicine just as effective as prayer um it all worked roughly the same amount of time so everybody had their reason to be that they were right you know i think you described some other marks in the same room was there a cancer symbol i think that you said sort of reinforced the idea that they were looking for protection against disease yes absolutely yeah uh, that's um in the hall right near the door into that room uh is the symbol for the, the zodiac symbol cancer um and cancer is another symbol that uh the the sign will protect you from disease again yeah there are a lot of hex marks and a surprising number of them are specifically uh protections against illness rather than just general evilness so yeah that's that's what leads me to um strongly believe that there's um some fairly serious illness in the family around around the same time as the events uh with Jason. So I know at at history camp you gave an example of what modern so-called modern medicine at the time the the end of the 18th beginning of the 19th century would have had to offer for somebody suffer, suffering from epilepsy. Uh what would have gone into a cure like that? Uh, a variety of things that we know today would um, not be good for you. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, the 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 short list here is um, uh, red valerian root, uh, pulverized uh, castor, as in mm. castor oil, uh, cursin, which is um, pretty much um, similar to um, quinine, the stuff they use for malaria, cinnamon. That certainly helps. <laughs> uh, folic acid, gel up. Tel- so anyway, um, infused frigid wine, garlic, <laughs> pulverized. They they use all these weird abbreviations back then and just expect you sure. to know what they mean. So, so far, valerian root, probably the most helpful thing. It won't actively yeah. kill you at least. Yeah, right. Um, well, that's the thing. None of these will by themselves kill you. It's the fact that um, what you have is three or four... Um, purgatives things that make you throw up Mm. you have several things that will give you um the opposite let's put it that way (laughs) um several things that just do nothing whatsoever um a few things that will give you um like give you a fever just right off and uh and And then then cinnamon to freshen up your breath yeah and then the cinnamon yeah which will definitely help the most out of any of those that Um, just helps it go down a little sweeter (laughs) <laughs> right, right. Um, well, they did originally believe um, a lot of things that we now think of as um, like cooking items started out as medicines, including uh, cinnamon, peppermint, uh, Coca-Cola. Of course, that originally had Coke in it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a lot of these, they thought cinnamon was actually something that would help. But yeah, it turns out, yeah, it would just make your breath smell nice. But uh, that experiment, another thing... Um, that I found in one of those these books to give an idea of just how far medicine had gotten at this point. Um, talking about epilepsy, those who have it in the second degree, the worst version, are imagined by the vulgar to be possessed by the devil. It has been observed that the epilepsy, especially the essential epilepsy, is very much governed by the moon. So, in back-to-back sentences, he's calling people who think it's demonic possession vulgar, and then saying, oh yeah, it's caused by the moon, not not the devil. So, And this isn't a medical textbook, um, that, that passage. But if it's that widespread of a belief, you can certainly see why somebody would be grasping at every straw, even the supernatural straw. Exactly, yeah. Like, even doctors are talking about how it's affected by moon phases and... The more I study medical history, the more I appreciate modern medicine. That's... Yeah, it's certainly one of Nikki's refrains. Oh, wouldn't you like to go back and see Victorian Boston? No, only if I can take modern medicine. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, that's something I always sort of, uh, sort of get people to think about at the house. You know, you have this old house, no running water, no electricity, no heat, and talking about you know the the medical conditions they had to deal with and the. Yeah, you didn't want to go. You don't want to go back in time. That's all. No, no. <laughs> I mean, the smell alone. Would not be. <laughs> the essence. <laughs> yeah, the, the essence, essence exactly. of the seventeenth century. A, <laughs> yeah, there was a whole lot of essence going around. <laughs> um, so, speaking of getting people to the house, uh, tell us a little bit about the ghost tours. 
So the ghost tour started um, pretty much right after I got here. So sort of a little backstory. When I got, sorry, when I was applying for the job, I was talking with the prior curator and the board, the the president of the board and some other people who, who were here. And I actually asked, like, are there, you know, is a really old house. People lived in it for, you know, over 200 years. Any ghost stories? And everybody was like, no, 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 no ghosts, nothing. And so I take the job, and part of the live, uh, part of being the curator of the Fairbanks house is you actually live in another building on the same property. And so I moved in, and I'm starting my job, and then everybody I talk to is like, "Let me tell you about the ghosts." <laughs> so I'm like, okay. Uh, so I guess there are ghosts, and I got all these stories, and um, and having. Worked in uh, in in the sort of thing before. I, I, I gave tours of uh, ghost tours in Boston for three years, and I've always had an interest in this stuff. So I was like, I realized there was enough material here to to make a a, a ghost tour. And I had heard from other museums that, uh, like the Mark Twain House, is a great example, who have had fantastic success adding ghost tours. Wait, and is so- the Mark Twain House haunted by Mark Twain? No, it's uh, one of his daughters, I think. Oh, because I <laughs> love Mark Twain. Yeah. Greatest um, American of all time. He's cool. Uh, I definitely, I recommend his, his uh, that museum both during the day and at night. I would go to both. Ooh. Like, I'd go on a daytime tour and a nighttime tour. Uh, really great museum. Really well run. So, yeah, everybody was telling me all these ghost stories, and I realized I had something here. So, um, I, I put together um, a, a, a ghost tour, and... Um, What's really interesting about that is, um, so, you know, my wife and I moved in and everybody's telling this, these stories and about a weekend, uh, my wife and I, while we're getting ready for bed, it's a little late, it's like one in the morning and we're, um, we're talking about all these stories people have been telling me. And one of them was that the ghosts would set off the motion alarms. Um, and part of why they wanted the curator on, on site is those motion alarms go off in my apartment. And so... Uh, yeah, the alarm goes off, uh, this, like, uh, as we're talking about how the alarm goes off, uh, so I go and check, and it's, uh, um, a motion alarm in one of the upstairs rooms, and so I, I turn off the alarm, I reset it, it doesn't go off again, you know, figure, well, that's, that's good for tonight, I'll check it in the morning, and in the morning, nothing's out of place, nothing weird, um, and this happens repeatedly, uh, from, um, from then roughly once every week or two, always between one and 3 AM. And it keeps happening right up until I start giving ghost tours. Then it stops. And it only happens, uh, if I've, if it's been too long in, in the year and I haven't given, cause we only give ghost tours in the fall. So like in early spring, when I haven't talked about the ghost for a while, it'll go off once or twice. And then I'll go in and like, just yell at the ghosts like you're, I'm going to talk about you later it's we're in the off season there's no one here to talk to about you and then they'll stop going off again um so this is definitely one of those things where it's hard to be a non-believer when this is happening like it's that's not a raccoon in the eaves or anything yeah exactly well that's the thing so it would always be the same room uh the hmm. east wing chamber so the second story in the east wing And the motion sensor in that room is about halfway up the wall. So there's no way like a rat or a mouse would set it off. It'd have to be something fairly large. And there's no evidence of anything large enough to set that off in that wing. And there's no holes in the wall big enough for one to get in and out of. But something's setting off that alarm. And uh, actually, there was one of the the last times it went off uh, before uh, the ghost tours silenced it. Or, uh, you know, uh, at least paused it. Um, one of the t- there's a rocking chair in that room and it had, uh, rotated about 45 degrees overnight, um, and set off the alarm and people have seen the same rocking chair rocking on its own, that sort of thing. Wait, is that the chair people are supposed to sit on when they pass out? No, no, okay. <laughs> that, that's a modern chair that's on the first floor. This is a rocking chair up, uh, up on the second floor. Ah, uh, on the second floor. Um, the ghost tours are very popular. Like is it that first year, um, was very good. Um, the second year, it actually sold out completely, which was you know great for us. But I said for all the people, we had to turn away. So we're, uh, we added more dates for this year. So we're actually starting uh, August 17th, Friday. Um, and then it will be every Friday and Saturday through the end of October. Um, at 7 o'clock, $15 for adults, $12 for children. And uh, I recommend reservations. And how do people make that reservation? 
the best way is to call 617-326-1170. And we'll make sure we include that in the show notes as well so people can reference that. And yeah, so that's really the best way is, is to call, uh, make that reservation. Um, and they will, I'm pretty sure they're going to, at least a lot of them are going to book up uh, pretty quickly. So um, very I mean, popular. I'm kind of scared to come back during the day. I don't know if I could come back at night. <laughs> uh, it's not too bad. And, and one thing I like to tell people who are a little um, uh, wary is that um, whatever is in that house, it's friendly. Uh, nobody's ever been attacked or hurt in any way. My thought is just whatever's in the house now is is just uh, family members protecting their house like they did in life. They're just watching after it, um, keeping an eye on things. Um, so there's really there's nothing nothing bad has uh, at least paranormal. Nothing bad and paranormal has ever happened <laughs> in that house. But yeah, a lot of interesting, you know, a lot of weird stuff that I, I cannot explain. So finally, Daniel, before we let you go. Uh, please tell our listeners where they can find more information about you, the Fairbanks House, and where they can follow all your activities online. The Fairbanks has a website, um, fairbankshouse.org. Um, that was just recently updated. It's very nice. Um, and then we have a Facebook page, The Fairbanks House. If you just look up Fairbanks House on Facebook, you get some weird Facebook thing that is uh. us. But if you look up The Fairbanks House, that's actually us. So Fairbankshouse.org and The Fairbanks House on Facebook, not, yes. not, not Fairbanks just House. Fairbanks House. Yes. <laughs> well, Daniel Neff, I uh, just want to say thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Well, thank you for having me. To learn more about the practice of folk magic at The Fairbanks House, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 093. We'll have pictures of the interior and exterior of The Fairbanks House as well as a floor plan that'll help you better picture where the different marks and artifacts were found. We'll link to the book Devil's Dominion, and we'll link to information about the new ghost tours that are being offered at the Fairbanks House this fall. And of course, we'll have links to information about this week's featured historic site and upcoming event. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. We're Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. While you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. If you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, please think about writing us a brief review. It's still the best way to help others discover the show. That's all for now. We'll be back next week. <laughs>